All right, I'm here with uh, Avram Miller today. It's uh, October, uh, pardon me, it's August 19th, uh, 2013, and uh, we're interviewing uh, Avram uh, specifically on how Intel invests in their future. How, how Intel invested in invested their Invested in their future, <laughs> very good. Uh, I'm Dane Elliott, and this Avram is Miller. Avram Miller, okay. So let's start off with a little bit of background here, okay. and the background that I'd like to get is education and significant contributions in your career path that led you to Intel. So, education? Well, you know, I basically am self-educated. I always say that I graduated from Avram U. I studied music when I was in high school and then I became a merchant seaman for a while. And uh, eventually uh, I got into science. I was always interested in electronics and I started doing science at the University of California Medical School. And long story short, by the I ended up in Holland, the Faculty of Medicine at Erasmus University. By the time I was 28, I was an assistant professor uh, in medicine, medical informatics, and did stuff in Holland and later in Israel, but uh, in business. But what's probably most relevant to our discussion is I joined Digital Equipment Corporation in uh, 1983. Uh, and I, uh, I had always used Digital Equipment Corporation computers. I had actually consulted for them, consulted for, uh, I knew Gordon Bell, I knew a number of people, and uh, I had kind of like a standing offer to join them. So when I decided to leave the world of medicine, because I couldn't leave the world of computing, uh, I went there. And I got a job in central engineering uh, Gordon Bell's organization because I wanted to prove that I could engineer. Uh, I knew that, you know, that was an important factor in making my way in that corporation. And I ended up running uh, half of the uh, engineering organization, hardware organization, the low end at Central Engineering. So it was kind of divided. Big computers, small computers, s software for big computers, software for small computers. And so I was in the quadrant, hardware, small uh, computer hardware. What were the models of the, the computers? Uh, so the P PDP-11, uh, 23, uh, the, all the Q what was called Qbus computers, uh, we sold them by, as components. I had also for a time the DeckMate, which was the word processing machine. For uh, At one point I had the, some of the low end printers. Uh, so a variety of products. And uh, so my organization both designed the new ones and supported the old ones. Okay. So, architecture work there, or mainly managing the efforts? Uh, so, I got to do some architecture work. Uh, and, well, first of all, it was my first year I was doing that. And there were m many uh, technical decisions that we had to take, uh, especially about how to evolve the, the bus architecture. Yes. Because we were running out of memory space, which was a problem in the days of 16-bit computers, and how would we deal with that? Uh, but after about a year there, I was drafted, well actually I, I guess I volunteered, but I was taken out of that job to run a new program. Uh, and that program was directly under sponsorship of Ken Olson, the CEO. Uh, we called it KO to begin with uh, for knockout, although some people thought it was Ken Olson. Uh, and later it was called the CT project, the Computing Terminal Project. It, it became Intel, I'm sorry, Digital's uh, kind of foray into personal computing. We didn't know about personal computing when we started. We knew about the Apple II. Uh, IBM came, started later in uh, uh, 80 to come out with the uh, work on the IBM PC. And um, uh, we, so we had a major pro program to build a single user computer. Uh, we looked at it, uh, my group was focused pretty much on the professional market. The, the product name when it, when it was released was called the Professional Series. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, did some of the hardware, since we're central engineering, we did some of the hardware for some other products like uh, was Rainbow, which was a kind of an IBM compatible product run by Barry Folsom. Um, that uh, work <laughs> Uh, taught me a great deal, but uh, but it also you know taught me about engineering uh, a, a high volume product, but 
I also taught me in the importance of having a good marketing strategy, which, uh, which digital did not have. Yeah. We can, can, we, can we say that you were seeing some of the seeds of digital's um, fall at that point in time, uh, mm. retrospectively, or was I it don't still know that I was that, uh, that pre uh, prescient. I uh, had, I was pretty close to Ken Olson in those days, and I would talk to him, you know, like one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we'd have these funny meetings, and Ken said to me once, he said, you know, um, well, I said to him, you know, we've got to have great marketing and a really good product if we're going to win in this space. And Ken said, no, we've got to have a great product and good marketing. And I said, no, and we went back and forth. And finally, he got really upset with me and he said, you don't understand. We are not capable of having great marketing. <laughs> uh, and I and uh, you know this this has been documented, but in a book called The Ultimate Entrepreneur. But I uh, I got one of the first IBM PCs and I brought it into our lab. And Ken came down uh, with and he t got a screwdriver out and we took it apart. And he and he he just thought it was the crummiest com thing he ever saw. He said, you know, you wouldn't be here if you built a, a product like that. So you know, this w it was a piece of junk as far as he was concerned. And uh, but he had no concept of software. He thought it. He just didn't have any idea where it came from. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that at that time, people had no idea of what the market for that product really was. No, and it hadn't really taken off. And there were things, a lot of things that weren't decided yet. Uh, for instance, what would be the network architecture? Totally no, up for grabs. Uh, digital could have dominated that with something they had, they had called DeckNet, which was really the best uh, networking technology out of the market. But it only used it for its own proprietary products. Exactly. Um, and so in 1983, I uh, actually thought about starting a company, starting a local area network company. But I got offered a job to become the chief operating officer, president of Franklin Computer. And Franklin Computer was an Apple II clone. Right. And it had uh, it was just starting to go into operations. To give you an uh, idea of how successful it was, in the first year of operations, it did $80 million. Now, this was in 1983. Right. And it was growing faster than Compact. It, Apple had tried to sue Franklin right. before I joined. And then they lost uh, that suit. Uh, but it was out on appeal. And I thought, oh, and the lawyers at Franklin said, don't worry about this. This is just a formality. And uh, actually, we started working on our, our initial public offering. <laughs> and, uh, but it wasn't a formality. The appellate court, court did not find against in, uh, Franklin. It just found that there were matters of law that it did not agree with, with the lower court, particularly the famous issue, which was, could you copyright uh, firmware. And uh, the appellate the court said, we think you can. And since the lower court thought you couldn't, and that was one of the reasons, one of 10 reasons, that they had uh, not granted Apple its uh, injunction against Franklin, they said, go back and rehear this court uh, case. And so everybody thought we lost, and our bank uh, wanted the money they lend us back, and there were it was a difficult time. I always describe it as like driving down the freeway at 100 miles an hour without any brakes and no gas in your tank. That's <laughs> how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because from a lay perspective at that time, which I kind of had was, because I wasn't really in the Apple court at that time, uh, I had the impression that Franklin had everything they needed to be very, very successful. And, uh, you know, albeit, you know, they had an issue of, of firmware, but one always assumed that you could probably rewrite that firmware and get away with it. Not so easy. And it never happened. Well, not so, it's, I mean, it's not so easy because they used uh, constants that were in the, in the BIOS uh -huh. uh, in ways that were, there was no way around it, not a, any good way around it. But, uh, but that actually, after that kind of played out, and uh, I felt 
I had gone to Franklin because I thought the company was doing really well. We'd raised a lot of money that I could be strategic and figure out how to grow the company into the, and not just be an Apple clone. Uh, and uh, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and I, I left. Uh, and, uh, but, and then I went out and I did some consulting and whatever. And, and then I got uh, a, uh, I think, I can't remember, from, it was a letter or a phone call, I think, from Mike Richmond, right. who's still at Intel. Uh, he had seen an article about me in the newspaper, and uh, some newspaper, and had sent it to Les Fidesz and said, you know, this guy looks like the kind of guy we should get here. And Les said, oh, good, find him. So before we talk about how that happened, talk about what a strategic effortless was managing and what a strategic hire is. Well, let me do that in the context okay. of, uh, right. of, uh, of how I got to meet less. Okay. okay? Because it took, evidently it took Mike Richmond a couple months to find me. And he call, uh, called me and said, you know, would you like to talk to Intel? And I couldn't figure out why in the world I would talk to Intel. Because as far as I was concerned, Intel made memory chips and maybe some microprocessors, but it wasn't a computer company, it was a chip company, and what would I do with a chip company? I don't know anything about that, and, you know. Uh, but, you know, he, uh, Mike w was kind of, uh, uh, you know, said some things to me that made me interested. And, uh, and the other thing was that the lawyers who represented Apple in its case against Franklin were the lawyers representing Intel in the K with the AMD suit. So I thought, well, one thing I know is these people have the right lawyers. <laughs> 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 so I came uh, and I talked to Les, I think, on the phone, and then we set up three days' worth of interviews. It was a lot. I had to go up to Oregon where I met a number of people. Uh, including Ed Slaughter, J.C. Cornet, I think it was up Jean there, Claude, yeah. or maybe it was down here, uh, and Claude, and uh, Mike Amar, and all kinds of people. I mean, I probably, uh, Justin Ratner, uh, I probably saw six people, seven people a day for three days, yeah. and including Andy and Gordon, and of course Les, several times. The end, Andy was interesting because I, st I took his book, I read his book, High Output Management, mm -hmm. and then I thought, you know, I'm going to write down a bunch of things. I never write down anything. I can't even read my handwriting. So I wrote down all these things so that when I had a meeting, I took my notes out, which impressed Andy that I, and I had questions there for him and so on, but I, I mean, I didn't need that because I could do it in my head, but I, uh, but I, <laughs> but it, it did the, it had the right effect. And Andy actually got up on the, in the meeting and called Les and said, hire this guy. So he re probably regretted it later, I don't know. But uh, so Les is this most amazing man who I think is the unsung hero of Intel. Not that Andy and Gordon and Bob were not fantastic people. They were and remarkable. And I, I had the privilege of meeting all three three of them, but, uh, but people know about them. Yes. Nobody knows about Les. And uh, I won't take our time to go back through his whole background, but Les played a really prominent role in Intel's development. When I met him, he was uh, responsible for something called the Corporate Strategic Staff. And why that name exactly, I don't know. It was a hodgepodge. So in it, there was Mike Amor who was running corporate CAD. So that was a corporate activity at the time. And so no place to put it, put it under less. Give it to less. Uh, Albert Yu was running some process that had to do with product line planning, uh, PLBs, I think product line business plan, or PLB, or something like that, some acronym. And he was kind of managing that process, working for Les. Uh, and then Ed Slaughter was there. And Ed had a group called IDO, Intel Development Organization. And the mission of Intel Development Organization was to create new businesses for Intel. And uh, two of them, 
uh, were reasonably successful, uh, and the others I've forgotten. Uh, one is the Super group, Computer Group, which Justin Ratner, who was up until very recently, a few months ago, CTO yes. of Intel. And the other was PCEO, which was a, a, uh, a basically a retail uh, group developing, uh, was computer retailing was just kind of starting then, and they were developing retail products. The most famous at that time became the uh, uh, fax board. So they brought, they developed the first step for using a computer to do fax. Right. Now this would have been 84 time frame. I joined August uh, 4th, 1984. Okay. And, uh, and so he had this group, and there were probably maybe one or two other people, I don't remember. Uh, and he was also responsible, the corporate person responsible for a project, uh, I'm sure we'll get into later, uh, with Siemens, uh, and a new processor architecture that was being developed, mm -hmm. uh, the P7, this was. And, um, and so he wanted to bring somebody in to a staff that really understood more about the computer industry. And I think that was the kind of the role. And so when I talked to him, I said, what kind of, what, what would be my job? And he said, whatever you want it to be. And he says, you know, I can hire somebody at a very high level, like once a year, as a strategic hire. We're hiring you because we want you. We don't know what you're going to do, but we want what you can bring to us. So, you know, that probably, I like that. <laughs> you know, that, that appealed to me. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, but in the process of interviewing, of being interviewed by Intel, I interviewed Intel. Yes. And I asked to see the strategic long range plan. And so I was given a copy of the strategic long range plan. I sat in a conference room, I couldn't take it away. And the beginning of that plan, it said, change is our ally. And I thought, oh, wow, that's great, because I really like change. <laughs> and so th maybe this is the right place for me because I can help them change. I used to jo joke about this, that when Andy uh, was in, you know, uh, interviewing me and he said, you know, we really need help to change, I think I must not have heard him correctly. He, he, I think he may have said, we need to change. You make us change. <laughs> <laughs> Very likely. <laughs> because it wasn't so easy. <laughs> Uh, change may have been Intel's ally, but it wasn't an ally that many people in the company embraced. Uh, I found out later. Yes. So I said, okay. And, and I said, where, sh where do I have to, where should I li locate? And he says, I, I don't care. So we had traveled to Oregon, we had traveled to uh, Santa Clara, my family. And so I let them both decide. And so they decided they wanted to go into Oregon because they could get a bigger house. Uh, you know, <laughs> we were coming from the East Coast where we were used to bigger houses than we could get in Silicon Valley oh, at the time. <laughs> so that was, that brought me to Intel. Okay. And uh, so that's August 4th? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what projects were you associated with during the time that you were at the Oregon, in the Oregon operation, working in Oregon, and how do you think they influenced or didn't influence the strategic nature and change yeah. at, at Intel? Yeah. Well, it's funny because I think I came to Intel with a, with a hope or an ambition that I soon discovered I could not uh, uh, pursue. And that was, I was really interested in the consumer market and not for computing necessarily even for computers. I was just really interested in consumer electronics. I had a very close, I have a very close friend, Steve Mayer was the co-founder of Atari, and I had seen the whole growth of Atari and you know, was always interested in stuff like that. But as soon as I joined Intel and I learned about all the activities in Intel and I had decided to go to Oregon, and that was the home of the systems group, which was run by Bill Latin, who was a vice president, and they had people in, uh, in or uh, in or a lot of people in Oregon, but they also had people in, in Phoenix. They had people, I guess, in Santa Clara. They were doing development systems and uh, and boards, memory boards, and other kinds of things that were being done. Richie Bader's stuff. Uh, well, Richie Bader's stuff was not part of the system group. Oh, really? 
I reported to directly to Ed Slay, uh, Slaughter and as part of the corporate strategic staff. Ah, okay. uh, later, it, it got merged in with the system group. Right. But that's another story. Like, so I looked around and I said, oh, well, what, what is system group doing? And at first I found out they were uh, thinking about uh, getting into the uh, PC business, building PCs and OEMing them. And I uh, spent some time trying to help them understand that market. Actually, I wasn't very positive about it. I didn't think that Intel had the cost structure. And I showed them some of the, I took them to some other companies and showed them the cost structure and whatever that they had. But there was also this project that was going on with Siemens in a different building. And it was like a secret project. And the project was to develop a whole new computer architecture using a new processor, which is, guess what, a 33-bit computer. And, uh, uh, and it was an object-oriented computer, and, and it was going to run the only computer language designed for object-oriented computers, which was which, which, uh, ADA, uh, ADA, ADA, I guess, it's, yeah, I haven't even said that word probably in 15 years. And, uh, uh, and there were a group of developers from Siemens and a bunch of, group of people from Intel. They were collaborating, so there was, they were working, you know, they worked for each of the companies, but they were in this building together and trying to develop uh, a fault-tolerant, high transaction-oriented computer system that Philips would use for the factory market. And Intel would then bring as the successor, can you imagine this, as the successor to the uh, Intel architecture, the 286, 386. Okay, that was gonna be the next, we were gonna give up all that and use this. And so I was asked to figure out that business and be the marketing arm of the, whatever Intel would do there. And we actually had a component business from there which we sold to people like, we sold chips actually to Boeing, I ran that too and try to put this together. And in doing that, uh, you know, we were looking for software developers. We were doing the normal thing you would do with developing a you know, computer company. I couldn't see how that company could ever be successful if after the th joint development, everybody went their own way. Because there would be two companies with exactly the same uh, architecture, not, uh, uh, not cooperating in the marketplace and we're just starting out and we would, I just thought that was going to be messy. I also didn't see how Intel could ever make a business in the computer industry. They didn't really have sales people they could do that or whatever. And so, right. so I, yeah. So let me, let me ask a, a couple of sure. background questions here. Okay. Number one, uh, this is actually the second object oriented effort. Right. There had been an earlier one. There had been an earlier one. 430. 432. Okay. And so, yeah, so in, Intel has some kind of object-oriented in, disease. In some context, <laughs> and, and it was interesting, but it didn't live up to the performance cost right. levels at all that they right. thought. So this was kind of the second attempt to yes. do this type of thing. Yeah. And you mentioned another very important thing here, and, and this is a place that I had some insight, even though I'd left Intel at the, uh, by this time, and you might want to elaborate on it. The fact that Intel saw this as a replacement for the x86 architecture in the PC market. Yeah. And why was that? Why did they even want to do that? It's funny, you know, uh, I, I, I think there were different reasons. One was that they still had competition. You know, there was AMD, you know. Uh, Cyrex. And, and, and this was in the, t the 286 time. Yeah. And there was a feeling that somehow the architecture, you know, would become a commodity. And Intel will be back into the memory business again, selling silicon by the ton. And uh, so they didn't want to do that. There were concerns about not being able to get to the right performance. These were also the time of risk, the risk computers. Right. I remember Steve Jobs was at Next, and he sent, uh, he didn't come himself, but he sent a bunch of his people up uh, to talk to us about this. And we were going around, you know, uh, to Sun, who you know had the spark, and trying to convince them that this should be the next generation, you know, uh, and uh, because this was machine was a risk machine, mm -hmm. so it was a kind of risk plus, you know, it had characteristics that made it much more reliable than other computers. 
uh, but it had risk kinds of performance and it was very scalable so you could add more and more processors you could build it any uh, size computer you wanted and I mean on paper it sounded wonderful <laughs> so did the 432 yeah and uh, but it didn't have an install base and with that install base of software I mean that install base of software that was on the 86 architecture was so good and somehow Intel was able to pull away with the 386. Uh, we had had a deal with uh, IBM where IBM was allowed to manufacture a certain amount. They were still a big player. They had given up their uh, ability to build the 386 in order to get, um, to be allowed to build more 286. They made a strategic decision the 286 was more important than 386. They didn't want to build a 386 computer. We actually went, I think, to Dell and got Dell to do it. Compact. Or Compact, sorry. It was Compact, yes. We got Compact to do it. And, uh, uh, yeah, we used to, our rabbit, we <laughs> used to call those companies to get them go out there and get everybody to chase them, the rabbits. Uh, so that's how they must have come to this conclusion uh, that this new architecture, and that was going to be the architecture. When I joined the company, there was, I don't think there was any question about it. Uh, you know, it, w it wasn't going to be the 86 architecture. It was going to be this architecture. But Intel was still going to own, and even in more sh secure terms, the PC marketplace. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that, I don't think that Intel, in when it started this program, and even in 1984 when I joined, uh, had any concept of how big the PC market was going to be. I mean, they didn't really. They, it was a part of the computer industry. Yes. Remember, you know, Digital, Corp uh, Dig Digital Equipment Corporation was still a major company, big player. I think uh, IBM was still, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't not the computer industry we know today. I think that's very important to understand. Yes. That only with like the uh, uh, IBM AT and then, you know, uh, and things started, you know, people started using, really using them in corporations. Corporations weren't really using PCs uh, in 84 that much. They were using terminals. Uh, they're still connected to time sharing systems. Right. It wasn't today's uh, thing. So you can't, you know, uh, un understand what happened in the context of Intel. For sure, for sure, Intel had no idea. No idea about the PC industry at that time. How big it was going to be? How no. How important it was going to be? No. Um, now you mentioned the fact that the uh, Can I take a little water? go uh, the uh, buying uh, effort and the eight hundred nine sixty I think was the right number for yeah. it um, was successful in some markets. Okay. Uh, you you mentioned Boeing. I had the well, general the chips, feeling that it yeah. was military yeah. types of. Yeah, the market. chips were, but the computer. So so what happened is that for you know. For good or bad, I felt that the only way that this effort could succeed as a, from the computer business point of view, not from the chips. I thought Intel could sell the chips, no problem. But from a computer point of view, Siemens and Intel had to give up their rights to be in the computer business by merging their rights into a, uh, a joint venture company. And Siemens would then become a customer. And Siemens would market that product to the industrial market where they had a very strong position. They had their own, own proprietary computers. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and so it was decided, it was a lot of work. It was very hard to get both Intel and Siemens to agree on the structure of this uh, joint venture. But eventually they agreed. And then uh, Intel made a decision that they wanted to bring in an outside CEO to run it. Right. Uh, and they hired somebody who was president of Sperry Computer, or uh, Sperry something or other it was, I think it was, was two companies merged. Sperry Univac, I yeah, think yeah, at the yeah, time. Yes, yeah. I wish I could remember his name, it probably come back to me. And uh, it was like a beauty contest. They wanted to get somebody who had a real you know, name from the old computer industry. Uh, it bothered me a little bit because on one hand I thought that was the wrong 
thing to do, but the, the, but the good news was they weren't, weren't asking me to do it. <laughs> and, and I might have felt like I had to, given that I proposed doing this thing, what would I say? But I, I didn't really want to do it. So uh, they hired Kruger's uh, last name, yeah. Uh, and, they, and, and he went up there and I left and went to Santa, Santa Clara. Uh, and I don't know how long mine left, uh, continued a couple years, and somehow I guess it was just phased out. It was never very successful as a business. Yeah, never really successful, but certainly the chips did sell into some military and I believe a bunch of printer applications, HP used it so Maybe, but the real south. benefit to Intel, actually it turned out to be very successful for Intel in a way that, uh, yeah, really extremely successful because Intel was able to build up a tremendous amount of technical skills in the computer industry uh, uh, that was funded actually by Siemens right. uh, for the most part. People like Kevin Kahn and then, oh, his name is going to escape me, but he was the CTO for the microprocessor business for such a long time. Uh, and so all these really technical, Steve McGeady, all these technical people that were really good uh, that we that we would never have attracted. They would never have joined Intel. We, Intel would never have hired them. But they were so necessary for the next phase of the business, right. and they were right there. So when that business faded out, those people moved into became Intel Architecture Labs. And uh, before they were Intel Architecture Labs, Craig Kinney uh, was running a advanced development group for Bill Latin in the systems group. And then later that got spun out along with these people and that became uh, the Intel Architecture Labs and then under uh, uh, Ron Whittier. Ron right. became the corporate guy, the, you know, the lead guy there. Uh, and Les, strangely enough, went up to run the systems group which had expanded and had done what I had always <laughs> cautioned them not to do, which was to become an OEM supplier of PCs. Right. And they started selling to AT&T and others, and uh, they got a little bit overcommitted, and Les went up there, I think, for four years, right. and ran the systems group. And I continued to report to him, but I moved to Santa Clara in 1988. Right. Um, one thought on the, the that I'd like to know a little bit more about on the on the systems group, Intel eventually became and a few other chip suppliers became the source of systems architecture for the entire PC world. Yeah, I mean Dell didn't know do yeah, their own yes, architecture. Yeah. Was that a direct outgrowth of this of this effort? So I believe that most of those designs, all that design stuff that Intel would do and also all the things they would do like in software areas. Right. So like the whole, what was called the native signal processing, NSP. NSP project and all the rest, all came out of the architecture labs and mostly came out of people that had been hired by the, the Bind or the Siemens project. Right. That's why I say. Incredibly important then. It turned out, I don't know if it's really understood, it turned out to be incredibly important. Uh, well, I find one of the things that is, is very poorly understood in the in the PC industry is that in the beginning, every PC company had their own set of architects. They yeah. did their own design. They decided which chips to use. And a few years later, you bought the motherboard design or you licensed the motherboard design from AMD or Intel or Cyrex. Whoever right. was supplying the chip had to supply the whole solution. Right, well I, I, uh, you know, I always thought of them as being, the, all those PC OEMs as being our distributors. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, not only our distributors, but also Microsoft's distributors, you know. So uh, those were the days when Intel and Microsoft had 120% of the profits of the computer industry because everybody else was losing money. <laughs> Yes, that's <laughs> quite a perception. Okay, so that pretty much brings us to a close. Any other comments about the Oregon uh, no. stuff that you think are okay? No. So let's move on to uh, coming down here to Santa Clara. Okay, another big move for your family. Hopefully, you found a, a house that was a little larger than you'd see, you'd seen before. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, until stock had increased a little bit. So yes. Uh, and uh, yes, we moved to Palo Alto. My wife. Uh, went on to do her PhD at Stanford. My kids right. 
uh, there, and uh, and I was working uh, uh, in Santa Clara, which I think you know everybody said they always said you know Intel doesn't have a headquarters, you know there is no thing, and you know I discovered that that's what you told people that weren't living in Santa Clara, <laughs> because if you were in Santa Clara. You knew it was a different situation because you just had hallway conversations with people that you would never have met otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and so I began to uh, work on, uh, mostly on networking. I was convinced, I had always been interested in networking. And in, for, in fact, one of my, the only project I ever had with Intel before I joined Intel was Ethernet because when I was at Digital, my group had been selected to work with Intel and Xerox on a th on the, uh, to bring Ethernet to the market. And I built the first, what essentially was the first personal computer, I have one in my home uh, still, that actually had an ether built in Ethernet. This uh, was the old vampire connection stuff? Yeah, it was the, you know, the yellow cable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, uh, uh, so the uh, so I was always interested in networking, and I w and I really felt that networking first in the business uh, uh, area was going to be really important to grow to make it possible to actually use personal computers as opposed to terminals as the way for corporations to communicate, and uh, and so I kind of approached that from a, a number of areas. I thought Intel could become a big major networking company, C and I really. That was my ambition. So I uh, kind of put together a roadmap for that. Uh, I thought that we needed to get there. Uh, primarily, we didn't have the skills. We had some of the skills because we could do all the chips if we knew what to do. But we needed some other skills. And, and so I, uh, uh, I thought about, well, first of all, I thought about acquiring a big company. So 3Com was a large company. Right. And Cisco was also becoming a larger company. Cisco was kind of on the ascent, and 3Com was on the descent. Yes. Uh, I knew the guys at 3Com. I had given them the first order when it was at Digital. They built a, a board that plugged into my the computer I was responsible for. Metcalf uh, and uh, well, okay, Bill Cr uh, Kraus were the two founders. Yes, I know them both. And so I thought, well, and they were kind of being beaten up in the market a bit. And I thought maybe that would be the company. So. Uh, and then, and so I, I, I made a presentation to Andy and other people, I don't think it was at the board, but a pretty high level com about 3Com, let's buy 3Com, and the, we don't want 3Com, they're has -beens. So then I went and I met with Cisco, I did a bunch of work on Cisco, I had investment bankers, I did all the stuff, all the presentations, I came, and they said, that's a great company, but it's too expensive. So, so then, I understood. I, get, I said, in fact, I said, I got it. I got it. We don't want anything we can afford, and we can't afford anything we want, <laughs> right? Uh, so, but that was it, you know? So then I decided we could buy something smaller because that wouldn't affect our, uh, it wouldn't affect the stock price. And um, I found a company called Jupiter systems in, uh, in that had a lot of software for networking. And, uh, and I'm talking about really complex, not just simple local area networks, but I'm talking about the whole shebang of, you know, of routing, emulations, other kinds of stuff. And it had a s CEO, Jim Flash. And I thought, wow, oh, this is a great group of people. Let's buy the company and then they'll become, we'll be able to use their technology, but more importantly, we'll be able to use these people. And then there was another company called Land Systems, and, uh, and I looked at them, and, I, and they had some relationship with, I think maybe PCEO, uh, and they had a guy, Trump Pike, running it. And I thought, oh, well, this is a bunch of people also with good skills, and they were, a large number of them were located in, in Phoenix, and I thought, this is perfect, you know. So we bought both those companies, and both those gentlemen, Jim Flash and Tyrone Pike became officers of the systems group. And then Jim eventually ran the networking business, uh, PCO, the guys who were running PCO that merged with systems group and they left and, 
and he took over. So this is in a, a, an early strategic investment basis. Yes. Uh, of, of what what uh, Intel did with their money in order to grow their business. Right. We also, I think, in '88, maybe or '89. I think it's '89. Uh, I got less to agree. I mean, I got him. I, he he understood and he agreed to fund the development of an Ethernet business in PCEO. So uh, we took some of our funds, or corporate money, and we funded them to develop an Ethernet business. They developed the business plan. I worked with them on it. And we got chips from a company called Broadcom, which became one of our greatest investments ever, mm -hmm. and a company we should have acquired, but didn't. Uh, and we got into the Ethernet business uh, rather successfully at, uh, in the beginning of that business. And uh, we probably had the leading, I don't, I'm certainly one of, if not the leading, uh, add on board for Ethernet. Mm -hmm. uh, branded with Intel. Yes. You know, uh, one I of the bought few a few of them. Yeah, <laughs> one of the few things for the Intel brand that a consumer could buy. Uh, uh, I think we also had eventually the, the MAF chip was something you could buy, I think. Oh, uh, the um, the coprocessor. Yeah, the coprocessor. Yeah, yeah. I think that was branded at one point. I forget about that. Uh, so we started doing that, and it became really apparent to me that we weren't going to become a networking company, you know, and that there was just too much inertia and too many, too different, and it was just too hard uh, to do it. And uh, I didn't see these guys lasting. So back to Andy's admonition, you're responsible for bringing change. Yeah, so, okay. so I think I was two strikes down already, you know, <laughs> by this time because, uh, so the, um, so in trying to do that, and I kept trying to understand Intel. I mean, not only uh, the Intel, the culture, but what it was Intel as a company. The culture was kind of hard for me to understand because I was so different. Uh, but as a company, I, you know, I started to understand how powerful the c core competency of this company was. It was like nothing else I could imagine, and that we could just take sand and f virtually and and create this thing that would change the world. You know, and it was like the ro I I would actually give talks some later and talk about that we were the energy source of the information age. And I saw like, we were like the sun, that these ch this chip was the energy that propelled the whole thing. And uh, uh, so I just was trying to think about, it. well, what do we do? How do we grow this business? And I, and I didn't have much to offer the microprocessor business. Uh, I didn't know much about it, and I knew about the computer industry, but, and I saw all this stuff happening. And I remember I had a lot of conversations with, I think at that time he was still an advisor or the company, or he was writing a case study on the company. Then that's David Yaffe, who is now one of the Intel board members, right. I'm still friendly with David. And I would, t but he was a professor of, you know, so I would talk to him about, you know, business strategy and whatever. And I just came to the conclusion that acquisitions were not going to work for Intel but that if we could invest in early stage businesses, maybe we could have some strategic impact that way and we would get some insight. So, so that's what I was thinking about. How can we have strategic impact and how could we get insight? And I started, uh, and I talked to Les about that and he said, and he was okay. We can do some of that. We can do some of the you know, buy some companies and do some investments. But remember, I'm a strategic hire, <laughs> so <laughs> so I so I started uh, uh, doing that. And uh, to some sometimes it was, uh, and this kind of comes back to uh, I guess really was the beginning of of, of CBD. And uh, so Les was still in '88. There wasn't a CBD. I was doing this stuff, but Les was running the systems group. Les came back in 91. I was still doing the stuff. Uh, Les went away for about six months in 90, 91. And, uh, and I wasn't the only one. There were a few people, there were a few investments that have been done in the microprocessor group. Uh, uh, and I think Harold Hughes started them, and then Steingen, and 
Oh, there's a couple other people. Forgive me for not remembering anybody's names. Mm -hmm. come to, maybe they'll come to me. But they did a few investments in the micro. So this is kind of a watershed uh, change, if you will, in the way Intel thinks. I mean, up to this point in time, and clearly back in my time, yeah. it was strategic investment. We did cross licenses. Yeah, we yeah. helped people develop software for our yeah. stuff. We, but but the software wasn't commercial software in, in the sense of, or, or user-friendly yeah. software. It was a compiler, it was an operating right, system. Right, right, right. RTOS something or something had to like yeah, that. Yeah. So those were our strategic investments and and I think you pretty much confirmed that that's the way Intel thought about investing for a long, long time. Yeah. But this, when you start talking about minority investments in the marketplace that Intel sells into, that is a watershed change. Was it yeah. recognized as that? No, well, well, I think here's the thing. No, not at first, of course. I mean, God forbid that they recognized it, they would have stopped it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the uh, Intel didn't want to be involved in anything it couldn't control. One of the biggest problems I had as I started doing this was the fact that we couldn't control this. What do you mean? We're going to be minority investors in these companies, but our name is going to be somehow associated with the company, but we don't control what the company can do. And so the company could do something that might reflect badly on us. So, you know, these were real, so the control issue is huge, you know, a huge uh, uh, obstacle for Intel doing things because it didn't want to do anything it couldn't control, and it couldn't control everything. Uh, so, uh, I started doing this stuff, and I also was doing, you know, something deals that were, you know, the system group wanted, wanted to do. I would put those together. I started building up a small organization to do this, and then when Les came back, uh, and or even before Les came back, I should say, uh, you know, in the very beginning, Andy would come to these to the meetings where we discussed these investments. That was a little bit painful. Uh, because in the short time that we had to talk about them, we would be talking about something that that most people didn't know anything about. Because uh, by definition, they weren't us; <laughs> they were something else. You know, it could be. Uh, and so, you know, how in, in a, an hour can you explain to somebody not only about the company and the management and the financials of the deal and all the rest, but a whole new industry? And why is it important to us? Yeah, and why we should invest in it and how we're going to manage it. So. But we got through those things, thank God, for, again, for uh, Les's relationship with Andy. Otherwise, I could never have gotten uh, these things. He would have killed me. So we, got, we started doing th those deals when, and then Les, I think, realized this is not the most efficient thing. <laughs> and because Les had a strong relationship with Andy and with Craig Barrett and with, uh, 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 with um, Gordon Moore, and other people on the board, he was able to get the board to agree to allocate, to allow him to make the decisions up to $50 million. And so Andy sort of moved away. Uh, Les would socialize something if he thought he should, but they didn't come to the meetings. So the meetings, you know, were pretty, you know, just the people that are the deal makers. When Les came back, this is really the important thing that happened uh, that created CBD, which then became the became Intel Capital. It was only a name change. Right. Same organization. Uh, Andy and Les, I think Andy said to Les, look, why don't you come back? We have business development happening every place in the company. Er every group in, the, in Intel had a, something called business development. It's like having engineering or marketing. And they did deals. Some of them might be licensing deals, some of them, you know, various contracts. They could be in some cases, uh, loans. There could be, even in some cases, some, you know, uh, could be some equity. I don't think it's very uh, often used. Equipment but the development? The development agreements, okay. all kinds of stuff. And they're all over the place. And they're all done differently. And the only group that tried to keep some control over it was the legal group and people that te like Ted Vian. So Andy said, why don't you to look at this from a, to from a corporate perspective? Look at all the things we're doing put some kind of structure into it, rationalize it, get it to work, including the crazy stuff that Abram does, you know? <laughs> so, you know, the business, you know, so was Abram, put him in there too. So, so then we created uh, corporate business development. 
and the idea of corporate being the whole corporation, business development being the generic term for all these things that were going on. Uh, but kind of quickly, it became pretty much just minority investments and, and uh, or joint ventures or loans or you know equity uh, acquiring company. But you know we didn't do licensing stuff that never really took. Licensing tended to fall off in the later that, years. Yeah, totally. it just it wasn't part of what we did. So I uh, and I spent a lot of time talking to Les about the need, the str strategy that I had. So the strategy I had was let's uh, ex grow the company. Let's not just support the business unit so they do better deals, you know, cleaner deals, you know, better financially, better legally, better operational deals with the discipline in. Structure it the same. Structure way. it. Let, that's good. Let's do that. But let's also do things that actually go out further in time and can grow the market for Intel's products, particularly for the personal computer. Uh, since we had 85% of the computer market, I kind of argued it doesn't matter if we grow it also for the 15% that AMD has. Okay, so let's just grow the market, not worry that it might benefit somebody else. Let's just grow the market. How can we grow the market? And so that was my fixation, was on growing the market. And in the beginning, Les uh, wanted the buy-in from business units for every deal. You know, who's the person who's the expert, whatever. And that really slowed things down because I would have to find a business unit that sort of had something to do or could somehow benefit with something that I wanted to invest in that might not pay off for three or four years. And so, and they weren't thinking about that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so eventually, uh, it was agreed that I didn't need that and that I would, I didn't need a business unit. I could just do deals. Uh, and so, then a lot more deals got done. <laughs> um, okay, so let's uh, let's just go forward from here in terms of uh, you know the kinds of strategic, ver or pardon me, not the strategic, the kinds of minority investments you were making, and how this is actually growing this marketplace. Because I think uh, I think there were a lot of different areas that you guys made investments in. There wasn't just all down one channel although a large amount of it was focused on how do we make the PC market right. itself Well, grow. so but what, what happened is that, you know, I was working for Les, and then Les des decided that he wanted to do more investing, mm -hmm. and that this was a good concept, and he wanted to go into some other areas that I didn't, I wasn't wanting to do, and, I, and uh, so for instance, uh, semiconductor manufacturing technology was one, uh, we actually went into health. Uh, we did uh, enterprise computing. I remember I said my dark secret was that I was really interested in the consumer market. Yes. So I was focused on that. And then uh, after being in Intel for uh, seven years, I took my sabbatical. So I came back uh, from my sabbatical in 91 and, uh, or yeah, 91. And uh, and I said I wanted to work on the consumer market. You know, I wanted to do stuff in the consumer market. And I had, uh, and Andy Grove said to me, he's, there wasn't a consumer market for computers. And uh, I disagreed. And he said, well, if you want to waste your time, go ahead. And then something very important ha happened that made a big difference for, uh, certainly for me, I think for Intel. Bill Gates called Andy Grove up and he said, you know, Andy, we're really interested in doing something in the consumer market. And we can't seem to find anybody at Intel that really is interested. So uh, we assume that you're not, you, don't really, you wouldn't really care if we worked with AMD on the consumer market. So Andy said, Bill, that's totally not true. We have a vice president who's devoting himself entirely to the consumer market, Avra Miller. I'll send him to Redmond right away. <laughs> <laughs> so before you knew it, I, you know, I knew it. I was up in Redmond meeting uh, uh, with uh, Rob Glazer, who was, became my counterpart for a while at Microsoft, and then later went to start Real Networks. And I believe he's went back there recently, but he was a partner at Excel for a while. And um, 
Uh, and they told me they had a, a number of different projects they wanted to pursue. One of them was a multimedia computer game machine They were uh, using CD. This is the day of enhanced CD-ROMs. That's what we had. Okay. And uh, another one would have been sort of like a, the, uh, not a phone, but like an iPod kind of product, kind of Newton kind of product. We worked on that a little bit. But the main thing they wanted to focus on was an interactive set-top box. Uh, Time Warner had started a, a project uh, that had everybody's attention to be, and, and the interactive device of the future was going to be the set-top box. And Bill Gates said, you know, the square foot on top of your TV is the most valuable real estate in the world. I remember saying that. So they want to go, so Microsoft's really hot to go after this market. And they bring, uh, and so I said, fine, uh, we'll put together a group. And I actually pulled together a group of people out of Phoenix and some people out of the Intel architecture labs. And we started working on what we called a Pandora, P Pandora's box. And we started putting together an interactive set-top box. So I wasn't just doing business development in the sense of minority investments. I was like managing the Intel relationship, consumer relationship. Uh, and I would meet with the Intel seniors. You know, we had an executive meeting with Microsoft every quarter. I would go to those meetings. Later, Craig Mundy took over the, uh, from, uh, became CTO of Microsoft, took over from Rob Glazer, and he was my counterpart. And, go, and, um, and so we'd have these meetings and set top box. And in that process, uh, I realized there was never going to be an interactive set top box, at least not anytime soon because there was no way that we could build one cheap enough. And the other thing I learned was that there's just not enough pixels on the TV. And also, you don't want to interact from 12 feet, you know? So, so, but I learned during that process, I learned how the cable industry actually worked technically and business-wise. But I understood the technology of the cable industry I'd never knew before. And I realized, my God, there's so much bandwidth in this coax cable. You know, there's gigabits of bandwidth in th these cables. I kind of knew, you know, we were baseband in e Ethernet, but, mm -hmm. uh, but there had been some broadband local area networks that had been developed earlier. And I, so I knew how much bandwidth was there. I was very really excited about that. And then I discovered they were working on chips to do digital television, to do HDTV, and also to provide more channels uh, digitally than they could do analog. And the, one of the leaders of the cable industry, John Malone, was talking about the 500 channel universe. He was talking about all these channels that would exist, basically to pump up the stock price. And, uh, but also he was, uh, uh, he, his plant, his cable plant, which he bought by acquiring old cable plants, was the worst plant anybody had. It, it was the noisiest plant, the signals were the worst, and so he wasn't able to add more channels analog. So he was really interested when somebody told him, well, we could do it digitally. And so they had developed these chips. And I went, and the chips were, and Broadcom was one of the companies working on the chips, which we had an investment in. So I learned about how these chips worked, and I realized they're packet-based. Oh my god, we could do the same thing as Ethernet over them. And, and I came to that realization uh, together with the CTO of General Instruments, whose name uh, is uh, uh, also uh, Miller, and I can't think of his first name, but it, uh, I'm having trouble with names today. But, uh, and, and we decided, you know what? Why don't we go and build a way for personal computers to connect to the internet at high speed through the cable network? But let's not tell Microsoft. So we didn't tell Microsoft. And, and we kept working on our other project, and then we had this project going on. It was called Edison. I have the business plan for Edison. And guess who was the CEO of General Instruments? Don Rumsfeld, oh, right. the, the former and then future <laughs> Secretary of Defense. Uh, so I would meet in his office. There'd be American flags and eagles and things like that in the background. And so we started working on that. Well, I want to bring this back to corporate business development. Uh, Les supported me in this activity. He thought that doing this was really made a lot of sense. And I told him that I needed to get the Intel labs to design the technology 
because the cable industry didn't have the ability. And so I said, I wanted to use co the CBD funds to do it. Well, that was crazy. I mean, why would you take money from the venture group of the company and give it to the architectural labs, the advanced development people up in Oregon? That just seemed like nuts. So I said, no, no, no. I'll get technology from them, and I'll license the technology for options in these companies that we invest in later when we give them the technology. And so we could close the circle. And we did that. We made hundreds of millions of dollars. We, we, you know, we turned the Intel Architectural Labs into a business. Uh, so, and the labs were really happy to do this stuff because one, it was interesting. Two, they never had enough money. So I, ha I think about 20% of the Intel Architecture Labs were working on these projects that I funded. Wow, I had no idea that it was that large yeah, group. Yeah, and, uh, and so later after, the cable, uh, so, we did, so we developed uh, DOCSIS, which became the cable standard. We gave it to the cable industry. Uh, we developed, uh, li later we developed ADSL. It had existed, but we modified it so that it could work in this PC l environment. Uh, I went around to all the cable companies and met with the CEOs and told them, I said, guess what, you're not in the TV business. <laughs> you know, you're a communications company. TV is an application <laughs> of your platform. But the internet is also going to be an application of your platform. You can imagine how difficult that was for them to understand. In 19, uh, I think it was 93, we uh, did the first cable trials. We did them with Viacom, who had a cable company at the time. And we did it with uh, Comcast. Uh, and, our, uh, and our definition of success was, you know, we decided that success would be if, if people were willing to pay to continue to run. And I think almost everybody was. People were just blown away. But we had no content. So we had to go to AOL and we had to go to people and get them on and into it. And then we actually put a juke, well, we call it a jukebox. We put a jukebox which had uh, enhanced CD ROMs. And then we could download them over the internet. So that if you wanted to play a game or whatever, then that was how you got it. That's how we, that's how we bootstrapped wow. the I, residential internet. I, I never realized that. Yeah. Not being a game player, I yeah. would never. Yeah, no, well, so we, and we went to the cable show. So 1983, <coughs> 93, the cable show, there we are. There are computers, and people are saying, why are there com computers? And we're internet, there's AOL, there's this and that. That was, and so uh, we were in the general instruments booth, and then later in the 1994, we had our own booth. Uh, there at the cable show. Uh, so I started investing in all the companies that I thought would make money by this phenomenon, the internet, the consumer internet. I thought the consumer internet was going to be huge because I could see people staying over at work to use their computers. And I saw secretaries st and you know, assistants staying at their desk at lunchtime on their computer you know, doing things. So, so I actually, I, I termed it not, you know, we used to have uh, work at home. I turned this home at work. You know, you, you went to work so you could do this, your consumer stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was going to be huge, and I started trying to invest in every part of it. So we invest in things like Verisign that did the security stuff. Mm -hmm. And we invested in the, one of the first music companies, Launch uh, Media, that became, was bought later by Yahoo. We invested in uh, Broadcast.com, Mark Cuban's company. I love it when I see the shark, uh, what is it called, the shark tank? Yes. Mark Cuban's on that? Because I, I was the shark, he was in the tank. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had to come to me and give me the presentation. And I invested in his company. Uh, and so there were a lot of success stories like that. And there were some that we didn't do. You know, we didn't do Netscape, we could have, but we, uh, you know, we lost some. Um, and so that, was, that, that became my focus. Uh, was primarily in every aspect of the consumer. Anything that touched the consumer. So I would invest in things that would be on the business side, but it had to have kind of a consumer uh, you know, p a c component to it. How was this being received by Intel, the, the corporation that makes semiconductors? So in the beginning, not very well. I mean, I remember uh, one Intel executive saying to me, do you think it's really moral to make profit from investments? I beg your pardon. And I, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, don't you think that a company should make money by actually building and selling things? You know, like as, there was something wrong in what I was doing, you know. Uh, no, it wasn't. 
I mean, either people didn't care or they thought it was weird or they didn't, I don't, I mean, they didn't have any reason to go after it, but, but we started making a lot of money. And so I always said that, you know, profit was strategic too. And uh, the reason we make money is because we, we really, un I think Les and I, I think both came to the conclusion that although that making money was not our, our strategic goal, uh, our goal was first making tr rationalizing the process. The second goal was then growing the market. Uh, I think the a third goal was uh, maybe influencing long term Intel's long term path. We didn't we didn't succeed there. But making money wasn't it. it well, we didn't want to lose money. And so, but then we started realizing that they weren't uncorrelated. That for a company to have impact in the marketplace, it had to be successful. And if it was successful, it made money. So, so we, uh, it wasn't the driver. We would never have done a deal, at least in my time, would never have done a deal just because it would have made money. You know, we would have said, no, we, that's not our business. Our business is growing Intel, you know, making Intel successful. Uh, but Evidently, uh, we've made a lot of money. So we were probably the most successful, by the year 2000, we were probably the most successful venture fund in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably had about $10 billion uh, in assets at that time. We probably had liquidated $3 billion. But, uh, you know, we were, the reason Intel was corporate business development became Intel Capital was because it was so significant now on the balance sheet and in the, and the earnings. That they that that people felt that we needed to make it sound like something more substantial, you know, like capital, you know. <laughs> well, that and I think also separate from Intel, the semiconductor company, to a certain extent. Yeah, but of course we were in there, and we were totally part of Intel, and so the uh, you know we didn't recruit that many people from the outside. Uh, uh, the ones that we did didn't stay very long because of the culture. We didn't compensate people the way people would have been compensated in the venture world. Uh, so people also, good people would leave because of that, because they, with the exception of a few of us who were corporate officers that, you know, got a lot of stock and, you know, were treated well by Intel. Uh, even so, I mean, I, I did quite well, but I would have done a lot better if I had been a client of Perkins or whatever. It was no, there was no comparing it. And so, uh, but did that matter? Well, I guess you would say no, because we were very successful. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the proof. Well, Intel is certainly perceived as being amazingly successful in that. But you mentioned one area that, that you don't think they were successful in, and that was influencing the strategic direction of Intel. Yeah. In, in addition to that, all the investing that you were doing, yeah, okay, were, was basically focused on growing the market that Intel sold into the yes. PC market, the consumer yes. market, and some of the other ones you've mentioned, like uh, you know, uh, equipment to build semiconductors, et cetera. Those are all areas that that are again right up Intel's alley, right, right, of right. the business they were already right. in. So the the things that I'm always curious about here are. You know, Intel has yet to really successfully move outside of that marketplace. Well, Intel's and gone, yeah. I mean, Intel had made one big move, and then, uh, which was, it was uh, from your time you know, it was a memory company yes. that became a microprocessor company. One of the great stories of all time. And it did that, uh, it was a crisis. The company yes. was almost dead. I mean, it could have died. Uh, it could have been taken over by the Japanese. It was really, I don't want to say life support, but it could have been. Close. The intel that we know, uh, you know, is so different than that what intel could have been. And Andy and Gordon took one of the, such a courageous decision. And I think a third, more than a third of the people were let go. Uh, and the decision you're talking about is to get out of di DRAMs yeah. and to become a microprocessor right, company. Right, right. And to focus at that, on that. Uh, and the and that's what they did. And uh, but you know, I used to say that we were selling sil silicon by the ton when we were in the memory business, and then we found gold. So we found a vein of gold. And but I would eat, when I was in, I'd say, you know, guys, eventually all the gold is going to be out of that vein. You know where we're going to be in a big hole. 
That's where we're going to be. So I, I didn't see it lasting forever because nothing lasts forever. And, uh, and I would have liked to have seen the company uh, evolve, and particularly in, still in the networking communication areas. That would have been kind of what I would have wanted to do. Uh, but it didn't happen. And, and the company has, the Intel, I mean, I don't know Intel now, but the Intel that I read about has, is the same Intel that I left, except the world isn't the same world that I left. And the, inf the Intel that was one of the top companies of the world uh, and had a market cap higher than almost anyone, in fact, it was the highest at one time, has a market cap lower than Amazon. Uh, and, you know, that's just shocking to me. Uh, and, you know, you see companies like Google and, you know, uh, particularly Google, which is, I wouldn't say Facebook, but maybe Facebook, but these companies that are a real platform for in this current phase. Mm -hmm. Apple's a th something apart. Apple's a very different situation. And nothing like Apple, and even Apple may not be like Apple. But, and Apple may become the next Intel, uh, you know, if they can't break out of the mold they're in, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But, you know, I would, um, I ask myself all the time, you know, what could we have done? Should we have done something, you know, uh, what could have happened? Why did it not happen? Uh, I mean, I, th I think there are a lot of reasons why you could ask why it not happened. So there, I guess the most important question for me always was, was there something I could have done differently? Right. And uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I, but maybe there was. I just think the company was so focused, and the and the business it was in was so lucrative and overwhelmingly growing like a weed at the time. Hard so. to imagine, you know, that it would change, and yet we were created by that same kind of change. Yes. And the history of businesses is exactly this. We used to have this guy uh, Christensen. Forget his uh, uh, first name. He's a professor at uh, Harvard. Who wrote the uh, innovator, uh, the uh, innovators' dilemma, uh, and you know, but stories about how you know little companies, you know, get into the markets and then take over from the big companies and all that. And he came out and he taught us this, mm -hmm. uh, and yet we just kept on. So uh, I'm I'm sorry about that. Well, I I've often wondered, you know where those decisions weren't made. Uh, for instance, there was one development of the Intel television chip. Yeah. Okay, and from my, what I can tell of that, there was a technical problem that it just ultimately couldn't work, couldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be reliable. But I have to think that there's another dozen instances where business decisions uh, were made, or maybe not made, that prevented Intel from getting into some of those markets. And a lot of it is the foundation business of dollars per pico acre of silicon. Yeah, but I also think Intel had some, a, bad, a very bad experience of uh, the Macroma uh, problem, which is that Macroma was, a, uh, you know, as you know, a, a, a one of the first digital watches. Yes. I think Ti uh, uh, Timex bought it. it uh, and. And Intel invested in this because they saw this as a semiconductor business. Right. They didn't recognize it as a fashion business and they lost a lot of money. And in my early days at Intel, when we would be talking about investments, I would see Gordon Moore, who still wore a Macroma watch, take his watch off and put it on the table in front of everybody, <laughs> seeking to remind everybody about Macroma. So I think that may have had some effect, but I think it's also this just you know, focus, 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 and uh, and also, I think that we had uh, we had a really kind of um, funny relationship with Microsoft, and I think you can't understand Intel without understanding Intel's relationship with Microsoft. So we were uh, we were the we were the uh, you know we were like brother and sister we were like brothers except we were the we weren't the powerful one in the relationship. Microsoft had more power in the Intel digital, uh, Intel Microsoft relationship, partly because of the sure audacity of Bill Gates 
you know, and the ferociousness of Bill Gates. And, and uh, uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine Andy Grove intimidated to see him in front of Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, so I think that Intel might have had in some, and maybe in their subconscious, corporate collective subconscious, the idea that Microsoft knows what they're doing and Microsoft will make sure we're okay. If we just stay with Microsoft, we'll be okay. Interesting. Uh, and, and now we see Microsoft moving to the ARM architecture and a few other well, things Well, but it well. happened as Bill left too. Yeah, yes he certainly did. So, I mean, I think, you know, once the real founders of these companies left, uh, and uh, you know, Andy w once Andy was gone, and Gordon was gone, and Bill was gone, and you know, these, uh, you know, maybe they would have figured out. I don't know. I mean, uh, but I know that Intel didn't believe that the in the tablet market didn't believe it would ever have an effect on the PC market. And it's pretty clear that Microsoft didn't believe that it would have an effect. So did Intel not believe it because Microsoft told them? You know, did, did Intel just think that Microsoft would figure it out and, and could, did Intel have trouble understanding that Microsoft didn't know what was going on? And, and I find that incredible because it was very clear that with the uh, advent of, uh, of Netscape and other things like that, that Microsoft was having a really hard time, right. you know, with the same transition. It's always been my observation that the, the first founding team that is, has a major success on their hands, they're effectively a bunch of risk takers. Yeah. Okay, I mean. Otherwise, by definition. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been founded. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made decisions yeah. like, oh, we're getting out of DRAMs and we're yeah. going to be a microprocessor company. But the, and I don't think it's fair to say caretaker per se, but the, the later management of the company takes far fewer risks. Yeah, they so have a big entity. They have a huge number of employees. They have a business and they get into a protection mode. And well, it, we're, yeah, I fear well, that, that that's what's happening in all these situations. Well, I mean, we're not going into names or personalities, but we went from, you know, design to a guy who ran manufacturing, to a guy whose background was finance and sales, to a guy now who was involved with, you know, process, you know, whose, whose job was, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, what, what was it called, the, the manufacturing? To build He's an a, operations guy. No, no, but to build a factory. Uh, oh, the exact copy? Yeah, the exact copy. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so there aren't any, I don't think there are risk takers, and I certainly don't know who you would identify from the strategic side. And maybe this is the nature of all companies, you know? And, uh, and we should be really happy that we were Intel when Intel was the company when we, we were, were in. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm grateful but for But on it. the other hand, it's, it's interesting to look at the, the few companies, the GEs, the IBMs, and whatnot, who have constantly reinvented themselves but over the years. But I, IBM's a shadow of what it was. They certainly are. You know, Different business. Yeah. Software, services, not a hardware business. It's, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a very different situation. Yeah. But yeah. it's interesting to look at the ones that are over 50 years old, to see what they did to stay in business, continue to grow yeah. their business, or change their direction. Well, Intel is not going away, and Intel will be a successful right. company. And we're being a little bit unfair sometimes because we're comparing what otherwise would look like a wonderful company to what had been an extraordinary company. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think that's fair. And, and from my perspective, I mean, they've just announced that they're accelerating 14 nanometer product process production, uh, and they're so far ahead of the rest of the world in terms of process technology. They just don't know what to do with it. Just don't know what to do with it. Where is the vision on what to do with this stuff? And I think hindsight is pretty good, okay, so they're all saying, or everyone in the industry is even saying, well, they got to get in and control and manage mobile. Uh, I don't think so. I have. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer. Well, I'm a, you know, as I think you know, I have a blog, Two Thirds Done, yes. and I've been working on a series of, of uh, posts called The Resurrection of Wintel. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that I really 
think Wintel will resurrect. But I thought it was such an interesting intellectual challenge. Uh, you know, how would it be that Intel and Microsoft could regain their prominence? Right. Uh, and the one, uh, so one conclusion that I would share uh, now is that uh, I'm sure that you cannot, as there are waves of computing, and when you're the master of one, you're usually not the master of the next one. And I, th and I think it's very difficult for you to go from being uh, in one phase and trying to become the master of the prominent, the, the current prominent phase, okay? It's just too hard. Whoever's the incumbent in that phase is just too strong. So the only way would become the new guy on the block for the phase after that. So I've been spending my time thinking about what will happen after I, you know, the phase I call cloud computing, we all call cloud computing. What will be after that? And if you knew what it was, and you were Intel or Microsoft or both, what could you do? To how take would you invest? How, how would you take your capability to, because you have the money, you have the talent, you have, how would you intersect that and become the leader of the next phase? It's never happened before. Uh, I haven't been able to find anybody who's done this, and I don't know that I'll be able to come up with the ideas that will do it. And I'm one thing sure that even though I come up with the ideas, it won't be done, because you know, they're not going to listen to me. But uh, I always offer my ideas to them, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I offer them you know, free of charge uh, first, because Intel was very good to me. But they never take me up on it. Uh, <laughs> well, I find it interesting that they have the technology from a process performance standpoint to be a leader in the mobile situation. What, I, what it b bothers me about it is the fact that I don't think they look at the business model and the issues with the business model. Uh, but mobile is you know, being hauled out because everything's being sucked into the net. Right, because it's what's collapsing the, yeah. the business they're and in. So. Yeah, so you know, why would you go there? You know, that's not the right place to go, uh, in my opinion. They could have gone, I mean, they could have owned Qualcomm. They could have been Qualcomm. You yes. Know? Uh, Qualcomm and Broadcom were two missed opportunities, yeah. I think. Yeah, and we knew that. Les and I went to Qualcomm, you know, when they were first starting. Jacob. You know, we, uh, yeah, Erwin Jacobs, we went there. I have, my God, what a fantastic, you know, can't we do something? No, no, we, we don't do anything, whatever. Uh, you know, so this is not our business. I said, so can I invest in the IPO? <laughs> okay, so I did. But, uh, the, and then Br Broadcom, you know, was another one. Uh, you know, had we, but the thing is, is I, I brought that up with Les recently, and I said, well, what if we had done that? And he said to me, if we had bought those companies, we would have destroyed those companies. And I, and I couldn't argue with him, because that was the conclusion I had come to. Mm -hmm. So then the question would have been, well, could we have competed with those companies? Could we have done the same thing? And the answer is no, because we didn't know how to do it. Didn't have the resources. I mean, we see Intel investing in the Fujitsu thing right now, yeah. basically to get RF microwave capabilities yeah. that they don't have because they need it for single yeah. chips. But it's yeah. technology that they don't yeah. yet have. Well, Intel's doing some things that maybe uh, make sense to Intel. I don't know because uh, I don't know. But I mean, they bought a while back. They bought a computer security business. Yes. And uh, then they have a big project to do something in the television area, which is, you know, where everybody dies, <laughs> you know, the ghost to die. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's resurrecting the uh, set-top box stuff almost. Uh, you know, <coughs> and, not, there, clear, but not clear. And say, there have been several times between the first one and this one that Intel tried to do something yeah. in the set-top box area. Exactly. But, you know, it's, I mean, if Apple can't do it, why in hell can Intel do it? That's really hard for me to understand, uh, but maybe they'll do something. Uh, Although now that they have new management, I you know the emphasis on that has declined. So it's uh, so uh, maybe they're not as interested in that. And um, yeah, we'll see. When you were uh, making investments and, and strategic efforts, uh, making yeah. strategic efforts b before you left in '99, was there any emphasis or any uh, intent uh, to uh, consider? Uh, the uh, the fab business become a foundry for other manufacturers. Uh, we I mean, Intel certainly yeah. has done that on and off, but it's never been a primary focus. It's been, no. a, oh, we got extra capacity, let's go use it. Right, uh, there was no discussion of that, and, and of course we didn't you know, have capacity. We, these were the boom years of, yeah. the, uh, of the PC. So there wasn't anything like that. I, uh, there are a couple things that I, w I should point out, though, that we did. Uh, 
you know, we grew the international investment business. So we were the first people to really do that. You know, we invested in China, 1995. We went to Israel, we went to India. Uh, you know, probably 40% of Intel's investments now are international. When I left, there were about 20. Uh, so we kind of pioneered that, which is right, because we were an international company. Right. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, no, we didn't develop any concept of, well, so the only one that uh, this will, <laughs> The only one that I, I tried to get Intel, for this was for notebook computers, I found what was the first notebook computer, the first computer that would fit in your attache case, was being developed by a small company. They had no money, I gave them some money. Uh, we had a prototype. And I, and, uh, I came up with a uh, concept, I made a proposal to Intel, that we should, own, uh, we should license this technology from the company exclusively, give them some money or buy the technology. And we should manufacture the motherboards and never sell anything but a motherboard. Because uh, I said that way we will control more of the architecture, we'll be able to integrate more, we'll be able to drive kind of the platform better, you know, and we'll let everybody package it you know, for their own brand and their own market, whatever, but only us would do it. And we did a whole thing, and it was actually quite, it made a lot of sense, I still think it makes sense. And we got almost everybody to agree. I thought everybody agreed. We had a board meeting, it was in Oregon, I attended that board meeting, and I went through the formally the proposal. And either Andy didn't know before, or he changed his mind, but he said, I, I'm having a notebook, I mean, it's like the kind that we have today, okay? This, is, this would have been probably in 90, maybe even 1989 even, early. 386 was the mm. main, it just came out. I had this notebook and it worked. And, uh, and Andy said, does it have, I said, where's the floppy disk? And I said, it uh, has a, uh, uh, an external floppy disk. He says, nobody would want a computer with an external floppy disk. And everybody in that room turned against me. It took a microsecond. There was not one supporter in that room. Project was killed. And I was so upset that I, and Rich Bader was helping me on that, the guy who had been PCO, mm -hmm. that Rich Bader and I got on an airplane and we flew to Japan, and we went and we met with a number of the major Japanese companies. And we, then we flew to Korea, and we met with Samsung and a couple other Japanese companies, and we flew to Hong Kong, I can't remember who they are, and we went to Taiwan. And at each of the meetings, we were talking to them about you know, things we were doing in PCEO and other kinds of stuff, and I would take this computer out. And the meeting would just stop, and everybody would look at this computer. <laughs> and, and they said, what is this? And I said, I can't tell you. And, uh, and, that, and that was the first time they'd be exposed to the idea that you could have a, uh, a computer that you could put in your attache case. So, you know, Intel could, and I have uh, uh, recently uh, written on my blog that I believe that Intel now, not this next generation I've been talking about, the resurrection, now should stop, should start building its own, uh, brand, uh, own, uh, own branded machine. OEM. No, it's general. Oh, yeah. it. oh, I see. No. Intel brand. Yeah, Intel brand. Because who gives a damn for, I mean, compact, what, uh, uh, Dell is, you know, uh, uh, HP now, Dell, you know, uh, whatever, like Laverno, Laverno, uh, Acer, none of those brands are worth anything. Those brands have no cachet compared to like an Apple brand. But Intel still has a brand. Right. And so what is, who needs them? So if I was Intel, if I was the CEO of Intel, I would immediately start f forward integrating and build my own branded product. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us were surprised that we, even, at, even at the PC level, yeah. when they were building and OEMing those things, that they never decided to come up with their own brand, rather that they- They were scared. They were scared of doing that, competing with their own you know, customers. And uh, I mean, yeah. I even told them, you know, we got to have a keyboard. We got to have, 
you know, something. PCO had the only, you know, branded products. I said, a consumer never sees a product from us. Was this before or during the Intel Inside phase? Were you there for Oh, it was during that. Uh, you know, Intel Inside started pretty early. I can't remember, uh, yeah. Dennis Carter. But yeah, well, Dennis is going to do a, a piece yeah, for us. Yeah, and that was that. a brilliant thing. But still, you had no, so fine, you had Intel Inside. So, you know, I mean, it, it didn't have, you weren't, you know, it didn't internalize, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way, even though it, it had a lot of brand recognition and Intel did pretty good marketing. Uh, but at that time, you know, we were afraid of our OEMs. That we were afraid that the OEMs would dump us and go to AMD or somebody else. And all of a sudden we'd have, they would still be in the market and they'd have all their channels and they go after us because what were they gonna do if we had a branded machine? They wouldn't, you know, and um, they would do that. I don't think they would have done that. I think they would have continued to buy from us because you know we if we had the best products. But but anyway, we didn't do that. But it's not too late. Interesting observation. I've always um, well, I've dealt with a lot of companies in the mobile space, and um, I've had a number of them talk to me about the Intel, who makes money business yeah. on this thing, and almost every single one of them says you know. Intel's making 40, 50, 60 percent gross margin on all this stuff. And we get put aside for right. single digit type of stuff. Right. So Microsoft and Intel make all the money and uh, in the PC market, in the laptop market, whatever. And, uh, and the, uh, the Dells don't, the Lenovo's don't. They right. live on a very, very thin margin because all they're really doing is packaging and, and yeah. whatnot. Uh, and a lot of PR activity and their distribution channels are all very important things but the margin that they make is very small. And I've had a lot of mobile guys say, that's why we don't do business with Intel. Because if we, if we did business, if we chose Intel's processor architecture over this thing, then they control us, they make all the margin, and we're stuck back here making 4%, 7%, not Well, yeah, because, the, but, well, because let's face it, this, uh, the semiconductor industry is not a good neighborhood. No. You know, uh, so Intel had a beautiful house in a bad neighborhood, you know, but uh, but the other people we don't have that house. And and they're also all saying, well, you know, and I don't have to do that now. I can license the ARM stuff. I've got design teams that can pull up stuff that's specific yeah. to my needs as rapidly as I need to go. And uh, you know, I don't see the advantage of going to Intel to go do this type of thing. Yeah. So is that a you know is is that an issue? You know. You, you say they ought to have their own brand and whatnot? Well, no, but I'm saying it, it wouldn't be any, uh, the reason to have your own brand is to control the message mm -hmm. and to be able to control the integration of the technology. Yes. And so, uh, so, there, so there, were, were, there were always reasons to not do it, and there were some reasons to do it. The reasons to not do it have evaporated, but Intel hasn't realized it. Okay. Or at least I don't know if they've realized it. They don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Okay, um, I'm about out of questions, but let me ask the obvious yeah. last one, and yeah. that is, you know, what have we missed? What are, what's well, what's I uh, think an, an yeah. item or two that, that you think we ought to cover here uh, relative to uh, CBD and investing yeah. and all that we I think talked about? The, there's two. One is, you know, uh, CBD to a large extent, uh, became, which became Intel Capital, was a partnership between Les and I. I think, and I can say that because I feel that way and because he feels that way. Mm -hmm. um, Les was the senior partner, uh, but you know, we worked together to develop it, but we had very complementary skills. So I really want to give credit to what Les did. So you know, this would never have happened, all the success that I had would never have happened without him. He was able to do this in this very harsh environment called Intel. He was able to navigate within Intel and he, and, and he was able to put in the processes that would allow this to work within a company like Intel and work at scale. So by the time I left, we were doing hundreds, uh, hundred or more investments every year. None of our investment, you know, we didn't, not every investment worked out, but none of them blew up. We didn't have lawsuits. We, you know, we did a good job. We learned how to bring people together. We we're the first uh, people to do investments that would bring all of our portfolio companies together and help them. Uh, we put in a process we call, you know, uh, 
a formal process for how we would approve things. We got the legal organization to dedicate people to this. We got this financial organization to dedicate people to this. And, uh, and so the, that was as much uh, a reason for our success as having, you know, the insight or, you know, the ability to go out and kibitz with people. <laughs> uh, and so that was one thing. The second thing I want to say is that, yeah, we were partners, but there were a lot of other people in CBD. And I don't want to take credit for everything. Uh, I can take a lot of it credit, <laughs> but I won't take credit for everything. So there were, you know, many people in CBD by the time I left, there were a few hundred that were working there, either in Treasury or within the center of CBD. Uh, and who did a great job, and um, uh, you know, they're tremendous people. So uh, you know, I'm not going to start naming them because I have to name all of them, or I can't, I can't remember all of them. But uh, and I think the people that were there, you know, enjoyed their time there, and uh, uh, and I try to stay in touch with the ones you know that worked for me. And they've they're important they've, to you. They've done, they've done well, and I'm proud of them. Excellent. Okay. Thank well, thank you. Thank you very much. I've uh, learned a lot, and I think this will go down very well. Thank you. Okay. Good.